I'm Sinead Delaney Moretwe. I am a research professor and director of research at WITS RHI. I'm based in Johannesburg and I spend most of my time working on HIV prevention trials in women. Hi everyone, um, I'm going to talk to you about cross-sectional incidence assays to infer population incidence and I'm speaking about this uh, from a clinical trials perspective. So I wanted to reflect a little bit on where we've come from, and many of you will remember the early days of HIV prevention where we worked with placebo-controlled trials. Participants were screened, and those that were HIV negative were enrolled and randomized either to the active product or to a placebo. They were followed up for a period of time, and the primary outcome was HIV incidence compared between the two arms. And more recently, what we've seen is the emergence of active control trials. And that's essentially the same, but instead of participants being randomized to a placebo, they have been randomized to one of two active products. The consequence of this though, is that uh, when we're using two active products, um, when the primary outcome is HIV incidence, we have seen that there is lower incidence uh, in trials with active products. And because of that, we have much bigger sample sizes. One of the things that um, sites have done in order to maximize efficiencies in these trials is essentially to introduce uh, pre-screening and uh, recruit only people who are HIV negative for screening for the protocol and then enrollment and randomization. But in the future, this might have to change. So the idea behind cross-sectional incidence assays to infer population incidence is that we would still uh, conduct a trial uh, where we would screen people for eligibility, enroll those that were eligible and randomize them to one or more active products. Uh, but uh, in addition, what we would do is anyone who screened and uh, was HIV positive, we would assess to see whether they have recent infection. And at the end of the trial, we would essentially compare the outcome of incidence in the active product groups with the incidence that's been estimated in those that were um, recently infected. And so this is uh, potentially how trials will be done with uh, an external control going forward. Uh, but there are a couple of important things to, to consider with this new approach. Uh, and I think there are three key issues that as clinical trialists, we need to think about. The first is trial efficiency. The second is some thoughts around the risk profile of the population screen versus that enrolled. Uh, and the third um, consideration is really around when and how to stop screening. So when it comes to trial efficiency, uh, we would not be able to pre-screen uh, and create a population that is enriched with HIV negatives. Essentially, we would want to screen everyone in the population who, um, whose HIV status is uh, essentially unknown. Uh, and we would be able to then use that population to identify um, the cross-sectional uh, HIV incidence estimates in those that have recent infection. This is going to um, potentially change the screen to enroll ratios. And here is just an example of a current trial with screen to enroll ratios, where you can see that the trial is very efficient, uh, where four out of five people in, in site C have been enrolled. And it's likely that with cross-sectional incidence assays, we particularly in those settings where HIV prevalence is high, that we may have much lower screen to enroll ratios and may have to screen many more people to identify those that might be eligible. The next uh, issue is really about the risk profile. Now, because we're comparing incidence in the enrolled population with incidence in a screen population, um, we ideally would like those two populations to be as similar as possible. So the first thing is that we would not want to um, have a large number of people screened who have known chronic infection and are or are not on HIV treatment. Uh, and the second trickier issue is that we might not want to have people who are, we need to think about how to manage people who are on PrEP. And that's because people who are on PrEP have a reduced incidence and there's a concern therefore that we may underestimate incidence in the screen population. So there are a number of options that we can adopt that can help us with that. The first is to collect data on 
uh, the known HIV risk behaviors and if necessary, adjust our analysis to account for those, the prevalence of those risk behaviors. Um, another option is to consider uh, restricting to some extent who we screen and so to only screen those that have never tested and therefore we would exclude people with chronic infection or that have not tested in the past year and so uh, if they're infected they might be recently infected um, and when it comes to prep I think we have to be somewhat pragmatic because we do want to see expansion of PrEP use in our communities. And so if participants are on PrEP or have a history of using PrEP, we probably would want to record that information and then consider stratifying our assessments by PrEP use status so that we can accommodate uh, sort of what is going to become a reality in many settings. The third issue to consider is when to stop screening. Option one is the traditional approach, which is to continue screening, but to stop enrollment at the target enrollment number. The benefit of that is that all participants receive access to enrollment and the potential to enroll. But the challenge is that you may not have enough of an HIV incidence estimate because you're truncating the number of people that you're screening. The alternative is to try some kind of continuous enrollment approach. The benefit is that that allows ongoing HIV incidence estimation throughout the follow-up period as well as the enrollment period. There are a couple of challenges with that. The first is that um, sites may reach maximum capacity, um, uh, uh, but there are potentially ways to address that, although they may not be entirely satisfactory. The first is to um, maintain a target number and so to roll participants off study uh, as new people are enrolled uh, onto the study. But there are risks that you may miss um, HIV incidence in people who've been on study for a prolonged period of time. And also it truncates your ability to measure safety after prolonged use of the product. Um, also, if you continue uh, screening but don't necessarily enroll, uh, then you need to be sure that you're able to link people to some other form of HIV prevention uh, so that participants do receive benefit even if they're not able to enroll in the trial. Uh, this might need the addition of more sites, but that is associated with additional costs. In, in all of these approaches, I think what's going to be important going forward is if we use this approach that we engage with the range of stakeholders that have worked with us throughout the implementation trial uh, of trials in these multiple settings. So for clinical research sites, they're going to have to adapt their recruitment strategies, manage the operational changes and what that means for clinic flow, uh, and make sure that they can uh, access prevention for people uh, who might um, no longer be screen, uh, sort of no longer be eligible for enrollment, but if screening is continuous. Uh, for CAVs and communities, I think there's going to need to be work done to educate people about this new approach, to make sure that it is acceptable and that people understand uh, the issues about excluding people with chronic infection, not using the trial sites as testing sites, not potentially exploiting them for reimbursements, but rather being able to refer people who want uh, testing or follow up on, on their HIV status uh, within uh, healthcare facilities and, and being very clear about what the trial sites are trying to achieve. Um, obviously, this is part of an ongoing discussion with regulate, uh, regulatory authorities and research ethics committees. And when it comes to sponsors, uh, it will, it's going to be important that uh, this new approach doesn't necessarily compare the performance of, uh, of trials using this approach versus um, trials done previously, because it's likely that um, the additional screening that will need to be done will um, be associated with the lower screen to enroll ratio, and that may be associated with additional costs and time, and these are all going to have to be negotiated. So in summary, uh, we've been victims of our own success. We have an increasing pipeline of highly effective HIV prevention tools, and it's likely that we're going to have to change our trial design appro approaches if we want to license these new highly effective products. Cross-sectional HIV incidence assays are one way to kind of include uh, external uh, controls for assessing um, HIV incidence. And, um, 
but they are going to require us to do our trials in a different way and to have a different approach to screening and enrollment. And in order to be successful, we're going to have to make sure that uh, all stakeholders are engaged and that their expectations are managed. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues who have been uh, provided input into this presentation and also to the HIV prevention trials in women working group that have sort of commented on this discussion. Thank you very much.